Okay, in this series of videos, we're going to get into actual GI organs, look at their uh, internal structure and their basic physiology. So in the first section here, we're going to just kind of do an overview of the GI system. We're going to look at the mouth, uh, the esophagus, and then the stomach. And then in subsequent videos, we'll look at the small intestine and large intestine. So again, we divide the GI tract into either primary or secondary GI organs, and we're gonna kinda go down all the primary organs first. So again, looking at mouth, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach, then the large, small and large intestines, and then we'll have separate um, videos on the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas as we go. So starting with the mouth, or the oral or buccal cavity, um, it's formed by the cheeks, um, and the cheeks of course have muscles in them, the bucinator and facial muscles, and then the hard and soft palates, that's the top of the mouth. Um, the soft palate is the back part, which uh, is softer um, and not made from bone. Uh, the tongue forms the floor, the buccal cavity, and then of course the teeth, uh, of course the teeth line it as well. Um, the mucosa here is again, uh, squamous epithelium, it's the non-keratinized stratified squamous, so it's layers of squamous epithelium, which has a protective role. Now importantly, um, through ducts that lead into the oral cavity, we have the salivary glands and they release saliva. We have three major glands and there are many, many minor salivary glands. So the big ones are the parotid glands, uh, and each of these glands are bilateral, so there's one on each side of the body. Uh, the bilaterals are located inferior and anterior to the ears. So here's the parotid gland here. Um, and um, it's uh, between the skin and the masseter muscle itself. So it lies over the muscle. Um, the salivary and the saliva enters the buccal cavity via parotid ducts. Now this is important uh, for a number of reasons. One is you can actually get little accessory ducts on the parotid duct and they secrete additional saliva. Um, but you can also get stones that block the parotid duct and that can actually cause a backup of saliva and uh, that can cause significant swelling and uh, whatnot in the parotid gland itself. Uh, we'll talk about those in a bit. There are submandibular glands that are found in the floor of the mouth and then sublingual uh, glands underneath the, tummy, uh, the tongue. So here we have in the diagram below, you can see the submandibular glands and the sublingual vans, uh, glands, and they all have, again, their own ducts which connect to the oral cavity. Now, as is pretty obvious, the basic functions of the mouth are mastication, chewing, um, and uh, that's part of mechanical digestion. There's also the sensory aspect of the taste buds on the tongue, and there are, again, five basic taste buds. Um, they're found in these little taste organs, um, and uh, there's one for sweet, one for sour, one for salty. There's also um, umami sensation. And um, the bitter sensation is the fifth. Um, and they're each reacting to different things. So the sour receptors pick up hydrogen ions. Uh, the sweet are detecting glucose molecules. Salty are de detecting sodium or uh, other um, uh, electrolytes like uh, potassium and so forth. Uh, so they all um, are responding to different things. Um, chemical digestion in the mouth really, there's two uh, activities here. One is via salivary amylase, and that's secreted by the salivary glands. It initiates the digestion of starch. So it's breaking starch into dye and trisaccharides and uh, short chain glucose polymers. These are called alpha dextrins. Then there's lingual lipase, which is secreted by the lingual glands in the tongue and that uh, is going to remove fatty acids from glycerol and triglycerides. So it's beginning to form diglycerides, which will be the first part of the digestive process. Uh, the food from the mouth then will enter the pharynx, and the very back part of the pharynx, uh, back behind the uvula, which is a little piece of tissue that hangs down, uh, this is the oral pharynx, and then as the food goes down, we have the laryngeal pharynx. Now, up above, there is actually connected to the nasal cavity, the nasopharynx, and that's where the adenoids are located. And of course, we have our major, uh, major tonsils here as well on either side of the uh, arches. Um, the, there are muscular contractions in the esophagus, so that's gonna propel the food down the esophagus. And in the pathology section, we'll talk about some of the uh, esophageal disorders, for example, achalasia, uh, just a esophageal motility disorder where you get spasms in the uh, esophagus and the food can't actually move down. 
So the saliva itself is mostly water. Um, it has mostly a basic or about a neutral to basic pH. So it's between six and eight. Remember, uh, pH of seven is neutral. And it includes a lot of ions like sodium and chloride and bicarbonate. Uh, it's pretty um, generally low in sodium and chloride compared to other tissues. Um, so potassium, I should mention, is probably the highest concentration there. Um, there are a number of organic substances like urea, uric acid. There's, of course, mucus and secretory IgA, which we already talked about in the context of the small intestine lining. Um, there's lysozyme, which is antibacterial. Uh, again, the salivary and, uh, alpha amylase, uh, that acts on starch. should mention it's also called tylen. And then lingual lipase, and that begins the process of lipid digestion. Um, it's stimulated by the parasympathetic nervous system via the facial nerve, which is cranial nerve number seven. So that's different than the vagus, which innervates most of the gut. And then the glossal pharyngeal nerve, which is cranial nerve number nine. Both of these will increase secretion of saliva, especially watery saliva. <clears throat> the sympathetic nervous system uh, really causes a secrease, an increase in viscous saliva, so it makes the saliva more thick. And uh, that's innervated, uh, stimulated by nerves in the uh, in the neck region, um, they actually have their nerve roots in the T1 to T3 uh, regions of the spinal cord, so, so the thoracic spine. Um, so those are that's the nervous innervation, and that's what primarily either increases or decreases salivation. Again, we'll talk about some of the salivary gland disorders when we get to the uh, pathology section. So once the food makes it past the mouth, it enters the esophagus, and this is a muscular tube about 10 inches long. It lies posterior, so behind the trachea. Um, and, uh, and so the trachea actually is kind of in front. Remember that the trachea and the lungs actually have the epithelium has its embryonic origin from the GI tract. And so it kind of branches off at the region of the larynx. We'll look at that with the, uh, um, the respiratory system. But here in the larynx, as you can see in the diagram, if I could blow this up a little bit. Um, there is uh, actually a little muscle, a little flap, it's called the glottis. And when you swallow, that cl flap closes and that prevents food from going down the trachea into your lungs. And it should go down the esophagus instead. Um, the esophagus forms from the gut tube, like we've talked about embryologically, and we can see it clearly in the fifth week of development. Um, it passes from the pharynx, uh, directly through the posterior mediastinum, which is the major cavity between the lungs and the chest, behind the trachea and the heart, and it goes through the diaphragm. Um, and uh, so right down here, you see the esophagus goes to the diaphragm. The upper end, there is a muscle, the cricopharyngeus muscle, which uh, fixes the esophagus on the superior portion. And at the lower end, there's a functional sphincter which joins it with the stomach, and that's called the LES, or lower esophageal sphincter. And that'll be very important because uh, we uh, now know that acid reflux that people get is usually not due to high acid in the stomach, it's due to relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter so that some acid gets up. And the esophagus, which is squamous epithelium, is actually not protected for acid. And so any amount of acid in the esophagus, high or low, will make it um, sensitive. Um, the nervous system, both extrinsic and intrinsic nerves, are guiding the peristalsis down the esophagus. And uh, various neurotransmitters are used, acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin. We've seen these already in our discussion of the enteric nervous system. You've probably heard of a hiatal hernia. That's actually when the portion of the stomach actually protrudes through the diaphragm. And there's different types. Sometimes just a little bit of it slides up. That's called a sliding hernia. Sometimes the entire stomach can actually prolapse up into the thoracic cavity, and that needs a surgical uh, correction. That's called the paraesophageal hernia, um, and that's a more serious one. But most people in the functional medicine circles, when they say hiatal hernia, they mean the little sliding hernia that comes up. Um, what we're realizing is that's actually often not so much due to a a diaphragm problem which should hold the esophagus in place there, it's due to more peristalsis where instead of having the waves of peristalsis push food down, things are backing up. And uh, again, that's often related to a nervous system problem, i.e. a chi problem if we think of the nervous system autonomics connected to the, uh, uh, to the chi activity.
The wall in the esophagus, there is a mucosa, and that's again the non carotenized stratus, stramus uh, squamous epithelium. Um, there are a number of mucus glands, and they increase the further down you go to the stomach. And then there is a junction between where the squamous epithelium meets up with the columnar epithelium in the stomach, and that's called the squamocolumnar junction. Um, and you can see this actually on endoscopy. So endoscopy is when you can put a scope down uh, through the nose usually, and then down through the pharynx, down the esophagus. And um, you can actually see the red here. So this is looking down on the lower esophageal sphincter. So this region right here. The reddish uh, color is actually a stomach epithelium. And then the, the paler pink is the um, squamous epithelium in the esophagus. So that's an important landmark for um, gastroenterologists when they're doing these endoscopies. You can sometimes see in chronic acid reflux, the Z line moves upward. So it's found really high up in the esophagus. And what's actually happening is that the um, esophageal cells from chronic acid exposure are undergoing a process of metaplasia. And uh, they're changing from the squamous into the more columnar epithelium. They're becoming stomach-like. So it's almost like the stomach process is moving upward in the esophagus. Unfortunately, in a small percentage of patients, they can become dysplastic. And uh, that's actually a leading cause of esophageal cancer is chronic acid reflux, which is why we're always so careful about working that up. And we'll talk about that again in the pathology section. There are lymphatics which drain the uh, different parts of the esophagus. So the upper one third of the esophagus drains into cervical lymph nodes, the middle one third into mediastinal lymph nodes, that's in the chest, and then the lower one third into the celiac and gastric lymph nodes. Um, and, um, and this is important again for esophageal cancers. They can often metastasize through or spread through those lymph nodes and those will have to be resected. And sometimes we can actually see in large cervical nodes and whatnot uh, in more advanced cases of esophageal cancer. And that might be one of our warning signs that uh, we need to look further. Um, submucosal plexus receives uh, input from the myenteric plexus and it also regulates the secretions of the mucous gland. So that's embedded again in the submucosal layer of the esophageal wall. And then uh, we have the muscularis layer which um, has uh, an interesting mixture. The upper one third of the esophagus is skeletal muscle, and that contains what's called the upper esophageal sphincter. That's under conscious control, so that's part of your swallowing mechanism uh, that those muscles can move. The intermediate one third of the esophagus is skeletal and smooth muscle, and the lower one third is just smooth muscle, and that's what contains that lower esophageal sphincter. Uh, and there's a myenteric plexus embedded in the wall there, and that's gonna regulate the esophageal per, uh, peristalsis. So generally parasympathetics will increase peristalsis as well as secretion of mucus and so forth, and the sympathetics will decrease both of those. Um, now the veins that drain the esophagus are important um, because the lower part of the esophagus drains directly into the portal vein. The upper esophagus drains into the vena cava, which is the major upper vein in the body, and the middle one third into what's called the azygous system. This is significant because in patients with portal vein congestion, like in liver cirrhosis, the blood can back up and um, in the, uh, the veins here, and they can actually start bulging through the wall of the esophagus. And uh, that actually creates, you can see in the pictures here, these tortured veins. They're, again, it's because of the increased portal blood pressure or portal hypertension, the esophages can expand and they can actually rupture through the wall of the esophagus and that can cause bleeding. Um, so this is, uh, can be fatal, as you can imagine. A person can have a massive hemorrhage, um, but this often happens in advanced alcoholism, uh, liver cirrhosis, and um, get developed esophageal spherices and that might cause a person to start vomiting blood. Um, often the blood is usually bright red and whatnot. If it's sat in the stomach for any period of time, like if it's something that's flowed downward and then they vomit it back up again, um, it'll be more of a coffee ground like in appearance. So it almost looks like people have eaten coffee grounds in those cases. So there's many reasons, other reasons that can cause esophageal um, bleeding. For example, a person from chronic vomiting can have a tear in the esophagus called a Mallory Weiss tear. 
and uh, that can also cause bleeding. But often that bleeding, again, can look more like uh, coffee grounds. All right, so that's the basic uh, kind of structures we need to know about the esophagus. I just want to say a little word here about vomiting at this point. Um, vomiting or emesis is actually controlled by the brainstem, an area of the medulla called the vomiting center. So the medulla is the lower part of the brainstem, and um, it uh, coordinates a lot of inputs coming into the central nervous system with outputs going out to uh, the body. So there are different afferents. These are sensory neurons coming in from gastric overdistension, from um, reflexes in the mouth and the um, oral cavity, as well as the vestibular apparatus in the ear. And this is why uh, if that vestibular apparatus is overstimulated, that's gonna tell the vomiting center to fire. Um, and there is a specific region in the vomiting center right back here. So it's where cerebral spinal fluid actually flows down the back side of the brainstem. And this is called the chemoreceptor trigger zone. Uh, this area is called the area postrema, and it's actually at the end of the fourth ventricle. This is a hollow space that contains cerebral spinal fluid. And um, it's outside the blood brain barrier, and it's very um, uh, sensitive to changes in the cerebral spinal fluid concentration. So, any drugs, toxins, chemo agents, anything coming to the body can trigger that. Um, and this area actually is rich in dopamine. Is, uh, receptors as well as serotonin receptors and that's why there are actually drugs we'll look at here in a second here that some of them are dopamine or serotonin antagonists that are effective as anti-emetics they block the signaling from that chemo receptor trigger zone um, the vomiting reflex is actually reverse peristalsis so peristalsis changes from the small intestine moving upward and we get relaxation of the the uh, pyloric sphincter, which is what separates the small intestine from the stomach, as well as the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, there's a, a forced inspiration usually, which causes increased abdominal pressure, and that creates forceful expulsion. Um, retching usually happens when there's a closed upper esophageal sphincter. So the bolus, remember that skeletal muscle, that remains closed, and so the bolus returns to the stomach through the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, what are some of the drugs that are used? So you're familiar with some of these. Uh, most of these are used primarily for either very severe short-term treatment of like motion sickness or vertigo, but it can also be for um, you know drug withdrawal, chemotherapy, that sort of thing. Um, the probably the most common sort of set of um, antiemetic drugs would be the 5-HT receptor antagonists. And of this category, the most common one is the Andensitron, which is the Zofran. Um, Zofran is very commonly used for all sorts of nausea, from like migraines, uh, again, motion sickness, uh, post-operative procedures, uh, any sort of cytotoxic drug like chemotherapy. Uh, has a, these usually have a long duration of action, um, and uh, they can be expensive, but again, insurance, if you're lucky enough to have a plan that covers it, would cover that. Uh, of course, they can have alternate effects by blocking serotonin receptors, especially lower down the bowel. They can cause constipation, paradoxically in some people, diarrhea, um, but also have what's called an anticholinergic effect. They can cause secretions to dry and so forth. The next category would be the dopamine antagonists, um, and uh, that would be things like the reglin the metaclopramide, uh, the prochlorperazine, uh, which is compazine. Uh, these block uh, dopamine receptors in the brainstem. Now, some of these are also antipsychotics and um, neuroleptic. So you might be like, why is my patient with chronic nausea on an antipsychotic? This is why. Um, they're not being used in that case to treat the psychosis or schizophrenia. They're being used actually to um, treat the chronic nausea. And this is for this is sort of a deeper acting category for chronic nausea. Um, then there are the antihistamines, and uh, that would be things like the Benadryl, the diphenhydramine, uh, the Dremamine, uh, the diamondhydronate, and then the hydroxazine. So uh, uh, meclizine as well, the antivert. These block histamine receptors, uh, which are another type of neurotransmitter involved in nausea. And so they can be helpful as well, especially in motion sickness. 
There are cannabinoids, um, so cannabis uh, itself, which is not a prescription drug, but there are prescription THCs and whatnot. The Marinol is a good example of that. Um, these, uh, the cannabinoid receptors generally downregulate any overactive nerve activity in general, um, but they could be helpful here for nausea. So they are uh, used uh, for chronic nausea now, I think most people because of the legalization of uh, cannabis are just getting cannabis on their own and not using the prescription drugs as much. Um, and then other things like steroids, anticholinergics like scopolamine are often used for motion sickness. When you get motion sickness, you overactivate your parasympathetic nervous system and that's why you get all these hyper parasympathetic activities. Scopolamine can block that. Uh, benzodiazepines, which is calm the whole nervous system, and then what are called NK1 receptor antagonists. Some of these are sometimes used in different circumstances. So that's an overview of some of the most common um, uh, anti-emesis drugs. So let's look next at the stomach. So moving down, um, stomach embryologically is, remember, part of what's called the foregut. It's a dilation in the gut tube. Um, there are several anatomical landmarks that are important to know. There's what's called the lesser curvature, which is this part of the stomach here. There's the greater curvature, which is over here. Um, and then remember the omentum is part of the um, peritoneum there. Uh, it's one of those peritoneal folds and that hangs actually from the greater curvature. The fundus, so the first of all, the food enters from the esophagus through what's called the cardia. Uh, think of cardia as close to the heart. Again, this is underneath the diaphragm, and the esophagus goes through the diaphragm, and the lower esophageal sphincter is here, and that Z line we talked about, the squamo esophageal uh, 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 squamo columnar junction. So that's the cardia, and then the fundus is this upper little bulge here. The body is the bulk of the stomach, um, and sometimes this is just called the corpus, corpus or body. And then the pylorus is this part here uh, down at the bottom. And then there's what's called the pyloric antrum and the pyloric sphincter. And this is what is going to, this is another functional sphincter made of smooth muscle. It's gonna control gastric emptying into the duodenum. So when you eat a meal, um, you know, the food gets in, actually the lower esophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter close. The stomach contractions macerate the food back and forth and the process, the food be, uh, becomes what is called chyme. So chyme is the mixed up macerated food you brought in. It's mixed with the digestive juices, in this case, the stomach juices. And uh, the chyme doesn't directly just empty into the duodenum. It's actually gonna be squirt out over a period of about two hours. You're gonna get little bursts of chyme going into the duodenum. Um, and uh, depends on what kind of food you have. If you eat a lot of fat, it's gonna take longer eat a lot of sugar, it's gonna take shorter, um, but that's the kind of emptying process there. So two sphincters, one up here at the cardiac, that's the lower esophageal sphincter, lower esophageal sphincter and the pyloric sphincter. Uh, now, if you look at the uh, stomach wall, it's actually folded, so at rest, so if you just look peer inside, it looks like there's all these little undulations on the inside, and those are called rugae, and they're uh, longitudinal folds in the mucosa and the submucosa of the stomach, they appear when the stomach is empty, and this allows the stomach to actually stretch. So it can actually go from being empty at about 50 milliliters to up to four liters. So it can hold a huge amount, and uh, these rugae are what are gonna stretch out, and they're gonna actually give more surface area. Um, if you look closely at the surface of the rugae with a microscope, you find actually that there's little pits, they're called gastric pits, and they open up into gastric glands. Um, and these glands are going to be different in the three different regions of the stomach here. We'll look at that shortly. But they're going to secrete the different gastric juices and so forth. Uh, let me just go down and I'm going to review the regions here. So the cardia, um, we got the fundus, that's that dome-shaped region. The body or the corpus, that's the majority here between the lesser and the greater curvature. We got the antrum, which leads into the pyloric antrum. Um, this is going to uh, really help further grind the food, this very muscular region. Uh, it also is going to regulate gastric emptying. And the pylorus that contains the pyloric sphincter, and that's going to regulate the emptying here. Um, the functions of the stomach are, of course, to uh, 
uh, continue with mechanical digestion and peristalsis. So it mixes the food bolus with the gastric juices. Uh, the bolus again is converted into chyme, which is partially digested food. And then the peristalsis will propel that uh, chyme through the stomach. Uh, the process of chemical digestion also begins, and that's going to be specifically with proteins. So carbohydrates and fats really don't undergo any digestion there in the uh, stomach. It's mostly proteins, and that's going to be the action of stomach acid and pepsin. Now, the stomach acid is a very low pH of about 2, so very strong. But interestingly, without pepsin, it would take weeks for the acid to actually be able to break that uh, protein down, or maybe days, days to a week or more. Uh, but with pepsin, it can happen within hours. Now, importantly, only about 20% of protein digestion actually happens in the stomach. The other 80% is going to happen in the small intestine. Um, so the stomach, contrary to what a lot of people think, is not going to be your primary protein digestion organ, but it's definitely going to uh, be an important part of that. Um, the cells that release stomach acid also release a peptide called intrinsic factor. Remember this one, because this one needs to bind to any vitamin B12 you bring in from the diet, and it's going to carry that down to the distal ileum where there are receptors for that intrinsic factor, and that can then allow vitamin B12 to be absorbed. Without intrinsic factor, you can't absorb B12 from your diet. Now, you can put it under your tongue and get some absorption sublingually. You can have it injected. Um, but uh, oral B12 is mostly needing that intrinsic factor. There's a condition called uh, atrophic gastritis we'll talk about in the pathology section where you start to lose those stomach acid secreting cells. So people will get lower stomach acid and they also can get um, loss of the intrinsic factor. And this is uh, most commonly due to an autoimmune disease which the antibodies actually attack intrinsic factor and the cells that secrete them, they're called parietal cells. And, um, and this will result in lowered intrinsic factor and that can cause severe B12 deficiencies. And B12 deficiency usually manifests with peripheral neuropathies, but in later stages actually psycho, uh, psychiatric neurological symptoms uh, that are very important to consider. So uh, we'll talk about that in pathology, but that's also another aspect of the stomach here. Little absorption happens in the stomach. Uh, the water can be absorbed if you're dehydrated. About up to 20% of alcohol is absorbed in the stomach. Caffeine is absorbed. And then some lipid soluble substances can be absorbed. Um, the stomach G cells, which are very uh, prominent down here in the pylorus, secrete gastrin. And that's going to actually tell the parietal cells up here in the body to secrete more stomach acid. And then there's an immune function. The stomach pH actually inhibits and kills just about all bacteria with the exception of H. pylori. And this is a real problem with acid blocking medications in that they can actually make it more prone for bacteria to get through. And there is clear evidence of people taking chronic acid suppression therapy like proton pump inhibitors we'll talk about. Um, they are more susceptible to uh, GI infections like Clostridium difficile, creating horrible chronic diarrhea as well as chronic sinusitis and pneumonia. Um, so that's important. The stomach acid, I'll just say one final thing, is important also for breaking down and liberating minerals from foods. So without adequate stomach acid, it's hard actually to absorb proper minerals like calcium and whatnot from the diet. So unfortunately, another side effect of the long-term adverse effect of the acid blockers is osteopenia and osteoporosis uh, because of the lack of calcium absorption. So as we already talked about a little earlier, we looked at the general GI tract, the celiac trunk, which is a branch off the aorta, um, sends uh, projections to all the upper GI organs, including the stomach. And so there are several branches from the celiac trunk, the gastric arteries, the gastromental arteries, short gastric, posterior gastric, uh, gastroduodenal arteries. You don't need to memorize all those, but know that they all come from the celiac trunk and they all supply fresh arterial blood high in oxygen and nutrients to the stomach lining. And I mentioned this is an aspect of what we might call the stomach yang, that nutrition is going to be needed for proper acid production and so forth in the stomach. The veins and lymphatics, more yin aspect, they drain away waste products and so forth. They're all going to drain into the portal veins. So anything that the stomach absorbs like alcohol or whatnot will go straight to the liver.
um, from absorption here. Uh, the lymphatics will drain into the so-called cisterna chile, which then uh, sort of gather together. They go through the diaphragm. They become the thoracic duct in the mediastinum. And then that's going to, I mean, uh, that's going to all join together and drain into the left subclavian vein up here uh, in the left upper chest. And then that's going to go all draining into the vena cava, which goes to the right heart. And so it's going to go straight there. So uh, any fat, longer, bigger fats uh, potentially absorb through the stomach lining, which doesn't absorb too much, but all that would go straight up there. Again, this would be a route, potential route of spread of stomach cancer. Uh, adenocarcinomas in the stomach uh, would be through the lymphatic system. Uh, and then the nerves, this is part of the stomach chi aspect. The parasympathetics innervate the stomach, and that's the vagus. Uh, this is going to uh, work to actually increase peristalsis, uh, increase secretions, HCL and mucus. So that's the parasympathetics. The sympathetics are going to come from the spinal segments T5 to T10. And uh, that is going to join up into what's called the celiac plexus, which is one of those prevertebral ganglia I talked about. Um, so if you look at the of outline of a person, not a very good outline, but if here's the diaphragm, here's the celiac plexus, um, here's the umbilicus down here. Um, those uh, nerves will then innervate, they're called splanchnic nerves, will innervate the stomach and they tend to basically decrease contractions and secretions like stomach acid. And then there is an enteric nervous system in the stomach lining, uh, myenteric and uh, submucosal plexuses. Now there are special uh, pacemaker cells in the gastrointestinal tract. What pacemaker cells are, are cells that can actually undergo spontaneous depolarizations. So they're like little clocks and they actually will set the rhythm for peristalsis. And that creates what's called a basical electrical rhythm. And that's about three to five contractions of the stomach per minute. Uh, so those pacemaker cells or the interstitial cells of Cajal they're going to work with the myenteric plexus, actually found right there in the myenteric plexus, to stimulate those, uh, the peristaltic movements. So that's the uh, nervous system or the stomach chi aspect. Now the mucosa of the stomach is mo made up mostly of columnar epithelium and its main secretions are mucus and gastric juice. It's only about a millimeter thick, so very thin. Um, there are gastric glands. So remember I said in the rugi, you'll see these little pits. So if you look over here at this diagram, um, you can see the rugi on the surface. There are these folds like that. And then going down, you see these little openings. Those are the gastric pits and they go down into these glands. And the glands have all these really interesting cells down in them and they're doing different things. So the, um, there's three different types of glands up in the cardia which is right where the food enters the stomach, the gastric glands are very rich in mucus cells. And that's important because that's actually going to create a mucus layer there, which will partly regurgitate back up into the esophagus to protect the esophagus from any acid. They also secrete bicarbonate, which is basic, and that neutralizes acid. So these cells up in the cardia normally do not secrete acid. Parietal or eccentric glands um, are found in the fundus and the body. So Remember, if you come, come in, we have our greater curvature, our lesser curvature going down the pylorus. Um, this is, again, the cardia, this is the fundus, and this is the body. So these glands will be located here in the fundus and the body, and they contain parietal cells and chief cells. And uh, basically the parietal cells are going to secrete stomach acid, so HCL, um, and they're gonna secrete intrinsic factor. And the chief cells, um, actually, these are going to be secreting the um, inactive form of pepsin called pepsinogen. So if you look over here, I think I have it written out here. Here's pepsinogen, converts to pepsin, um, and that's from the chief cells. Um, and then down in the pyloric region, so down here in the stomach, uh, in the antrum and pylorus, we have pyloric glands, and they secrete mucus, again, mucus cells, and there are G cells, and these are the ones that secrete gastrin. And gastrin really has several effects. Its main effect is to increase stomach acid secretion, but also motility as well as the growth of gastric mucosa. Uh, 
So it has sort of a trophic or growth effect there. And then scattered throughout here the, in the different regions of the stomach are the enterochromaffin-like cells, and they secrete histamine. And why that's important is because to, for the parietal cells to make stomach acid, they actually need three signals. They need acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, they need gastrin from the G cells, and they need histamine from these enterochromaffin-like cells. So all three have to be present for the parietal cell to secrete acid. That's why when acid is blocked through medication, there's actually a, there's several ways of doing that. One way is just to give basic substances like bicarbonate. That's like Tums or, or Tagamet, or, I'm sorry, Tums, things like that. And then uh, those are a lot of those over-the-counter sort of antacids. And then there are what are called H2 blockers. So the specifically, it's the H2 receptor, histamine 2 receptor on the parietal cells. So H2 blockers uh, would be things like Tagamet and uh, so forth. And these uh, drugs actually block the histamine signal, so that'll turn off acid. And now the most recent and most commonly used drugs are what are called proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. And they actually block the secretion of hydrogen ion from the parietal cells. So those are three uh, acid blocking uh, mechanisms, and I think I'll have a little description of that later as we go. Um, okay, so those are the three basic types of cells that we have in the different regions of the stomach, the cardiac glands, the uh, parietal or extinct glands, and the pyloric glands, uh, so you should know a little bit about that. The submucosa contains the submucosal plexus in the stomach, that's that nerve bundle which can regulate those secretions. Muscularis layer has three instead of two muscle layers, so the innermost is an oblique muscle layer, the middle one is a circular one, and the outer one is the longitudinal. So there's an extra inner layer, and that allows for a lot heavier peristalsis and maceration than in other areas of the intestine. Then there's the myenteric plexus, which regulates that, and there's a serosa as well. So those are the different regions of the stomach wall. And I spoke earlier a bit about the general gut mucosal barrier. So the one in the stomach is called the gastric mucosal barrier. And this is the property of the stomach that allows it to safely contain the gastric acid required for digestion. That stomach acid of pH of 2, I mentioned, is very caustic to tissues. And so it's amazing that the tissues in the stomach are not digested by it. And that's because of this gastric mucosal barrier. And there's really three protective elements there. So first is the epithelial lining itself has very, very tight junctions. Um, there is the mucus layer, which is very important. And that's secreted by all those mucus cells we just talked about in the gastric glands. And then the bicarbonate, which is basic, uh, secreted by the mucus cells as well. We can think of that as an aspect of stomach yin, all of this mucosal protective barrier. Um, if the barrier is damaged, then acid can diffuse back in the mucosa and that can cause damage to the stomach lining. Um, and that can cause what's called gastritis, which is inflammation of the mucosal layer of the stomach, uh, or gastric ulcers, and that's where the inflammation penetrates down into the submucosa, or in some cases even the mucosa, and can actually rupture through uh, the wall of the stomach. So gastric ulcers can go all the way through. Typically, it's just down to the submucosa. Uh, but that's what happens when these, uh, the mucosal barrier is damaged. So that is the uh, mucosal barrier. Now different things that damage it, probably the biggest one to know clinically is aspirin, biggest ones, and alcohol. So aspirin or acetyl salicylic acid, ASA, um, really decreases the mucus secretion. It blocks prostaglandins and prostaglandins are the inflammatory mediators actually needed to get the mucus secreted. So the aspirin will thin the mucus in the stomach and uh, that can lead to gastritis or the ulcers. And then alcohol, especially chronic alcoholism, will do that as well. Uh, severe stress, this is like from burns or an auto accident, you're in the ICU, that can also cause the damage to the gastric mucosal barrier through stress hormones. And then uh, Helicobacter pylori, talk about that one, that's a bacteria. Uh, they can damage it as well. So these are the, the biggest things we know that can damage that. So when we talk about peptic ulcer and uh, uh, gastric ulcer and gastritis, we'll, um, we'll be talking about these in more detail. Um, Helicobacter pylori is a gram-negative 
bacterium. It's microaerophilic, um, so it needs a little bit of uh, oxygen. Uh, it inhibits the it inhabits this this mucosal barrier, usually more in the antrum, the lower part of the stomach. Um, has a little tail called a flagellum, and it can set up shop here and actually cause low grade inflammation. Uh, typically, it forms what's called a biofilm. So they start communicating with each other and they put out these little fibers between each other and they create a biofilm on your stomach lining. Um, and they can resist stomach acid partly because, well, mostly because they secrete an enzyme called urease. And what urease does is it breaks down urea in the body. Urea is how we actually get rid of ammonia. So the ammonium ion, NH3, to get rid of it, the liver makes it into urea, which basically is carbon, then oxygen, and two amino groups here. Um, and, uh, I'm sorry, nitrogen, H2. So the ammonia is basically captured in this molecule and it's non-toxic. And then this is eliminated by the kidneys. Well, unfortunately, what the urease can do is actually break off the... Um, ammonium groups again forming actually just draw the arrow this way forming the ammonium ion which is actually very basic and that neutralizes stomach acid um, and so they can actually form this little pocket of ammonia around themselves which protects them from the uh, hydrochloric acid the stomach acid um, they set up shop the immune system comes in to try to fight them and that creates a low-grade chronic inflammation and that damages the stomach lining uh, Paradoxically, the G cells get activated. They start secreting more gastrin, which starts to help you make more acid, probably in the attempt to try to kill off the bacteria. Um, but this lack, lack of mucus layer with the acid further damages the stomach. Um, and we have clear evidence linking H. pylori with chronic gastritis, gastric ulcers, and stomach cancer. And that was a famous experiment by two researchers, Marshall and Warren in Australia in the early 80s. Uh, one of them, I forget which one, drank a whole vial of H. pylori showing that he thought this was the cause of these conditions. Before that, doctors thought that gastritis and whatnot was linked more, and ulcers were linked more to stress. Um, but he showed by drinking the bacteria, he actually gave himself gastritis and he treated it with antibiotics and was cured. Um, so from that time forward, we now have this idea that we basically have to use antibiotics to treat ulcers because it's due to this bacteria. The reality is 80% of the world's population or more is infected with H. pylori. And we actually think at this point it's probably a commensal bacteria. But for various reasons, probably stress for one, but other hormone changes, the H. pylori undergoes mutations and becomes more pathogenic and then sets up shop and does everything I just talked about. Um, so it's probably the combination of all the factors which makes it more pathogenic, which is more significant than the H. pylori itself. That said, the main treatment today for uh, gastric ulcers and whatnot is to actually give uh, acid blockers to protect the stomach lining with antibiotics, usually a cocktail of them, over a couple of weeks to try to knock it out. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the pathology section. Um, patients with H. pylori, especially these more pathogenic strains, have a 1% lifetime risk of developing stomach cancer. Uh, so again, most people have it, are asymptomatic, they don't get stomach cancer or ulcers from it. Um, and here are 50%, but I think the estimates are uh, actually much closer to 80%, they're not higher by now. So that's H. pylori, probably a commensal bacteria, but under certain conditions can become a problem. We'll talk about some of the tests that can be done to check for it. One of them is to actually swallow uh, a special type of radio labeled urea and uh, one of the byproducts of this is carbon dioxide. So this will be, if there's lots of H. pylori, they'll make lots of CO2 with the uh, uh, ammonia if you swallow urea, and this can be breathed out, and there's a special detector that can sense it. And if it's radio-labeled carbon, um, you can detect how much is actually coming out. And so that's called the uh, H. pylori breath test, and so that would be one way of checking for that. You can also do an endoscopy, when they put the scope down, they actually take a biopsy of the stomach lining, stomach wall, and they can see the bacteria in there. Or you can do what's called fecal antigen tests is another way. Again, that'll be part of the diagnosis for um, ulcers.
I'm just going to say a little bit about the regulation of gastric secretions. Um, really, this happens both through the nervous system and through hormones. Um, the gastric juice secretion is continuous, but the amount varies with the need in the body. There's really three phases to digestion. The first is cephalic phase, and that's regulated by the brain. And that's really where you just are eating, you're thinking about pleasant thoughts, someone mentions a good restaurant, your mouth starts watering. That triggers the parasympathetic nervous system and then the vagus um, basically releases you know, acetylcholine that'll increase release of gastrin and histamine from their cells, and that increases the gastric juice secretion. So that gets you primed for the meal. Then there's the actual gastric phase. Once the food reaches the stomach, um, that stimulates local stretch reflexes and whatnot, and that results in more gastrin secretion, and the gra gastrin will increase the, the gastric juice. Um, and that juice will, of course, contain hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. And the pepsinogen in an acid environment is converted to pepsin. And that's what begins the protein digestion. Um, if you get more protein content in the meal, uh, you'll have more acid secretion. So that's one way you can auto-regulate your acid. Uh, so it's able to sense how much protein is in the food and, and regulate that. Um, the stomach distension sends signals back to the brain, which increases the vagus nerve activity further. So if you eat a big meal, you get more, hopefully, of a vagal stimulation. Um, and then there is a break in the circuit, and that's somatostatin. That works uh, kind of as negative feedback. So the more this system is activated, the more somatostatin begins to be secreted, um, and that will turn down these reflexes. Then there's the intestinal phase, so when food reaches the duodenum, um, the distension of the duodenum and the presence of acid in the duodenum will trigger the secretion of secretin and cholecystokinin, two of those GI hormones I already talked about earlier. And they further work back to inhibit gastric secretion. So they calm down the gastrin, they quiet down the vagus activity in the stomach. And uh, the chyme, which is that partially digested bolus of food, is now neutralized by with acid. So the acid is neutralized by the bicarbonate as it moves away from the duodenum. And uh, that's the whole process here. So that's gonna go into the small intestine digestion. So these are the three phases, cephalic, gastric, and intestinal phases of digestion. Now, one interesting thing is we know that bitter containing substances, bitter herbs, vinegar, things like that, more sour, but you know, some crossover like apple cider vinegar, um, that that can actually stimulate the vagus nerve and increase the secretions further. So people that have really sluggish digestion, um, in some people, the digestion can get so sluggish that the, um, the peristalsis no longer properly works in the stomach. And that's actually called gastroparesis. Um, gastroparesis is very common after surgery, after general anesthetic, things like that. Food just sits in the stomach, doesn't move down. And this is often due to decreased vagal activity um, or things that are blocking the vagal signals. So bitters and the apple cider vinegar and whatnot all can actually increase the vagus and that can actually treat the gastroparesis. And I've had many patients where once all sorts of specialists to talk about their gastroparesis and it, they just took a simple bitters tincture and that's what actually uh, reversed it quickly within a day or two. Um, so that's, uh, that's something to think about. Now, when we talk about digestion, again, we talked about how carbohydrates start their process of digestion in the mouth with salivary amylase. That is active until it hits stomach acid in the stomach, and then that's neutralized. Same with lingual lipase. That's also neutralized in the stomach. The parietal cells, again, secrete acid. They actually secrete hydrogen ions. Um, and uh, the hydrogen ions actually come in. It's kind of a complicated process. So the, there's little proton pumps located in the wall of the parietal cell. So this is going to be towards the lumen of the stomach. This is again down in one of those glands. Um, the uh, hydrogen ion uh, is secreted here. Uh, we get some potassium that actually goes the other way. Hydrogen goes uh, out of the cell and then chloride through a transporter comes out. So that's gonna make HCl hydrochloric acid. Um, there's another channel for potassium, so that'll be brought back out again. Um, at the same time, we have uh, chloride is actually brought in from the blood through a transporter. And to actually get the chloride in, we have to take bicarbonate out of the parietal cell into the blood. And so paradoxically, the stomach gets more acid 
and the blood becomes more basic after eating a heavy meal that makes a lot of, especially a protein meal that makes a lot of stomach acid. So that's kind of interesting. Um, so that's, that creates what's called an alkaline tide after this process. Now the bicarbonate is usually transported back into the gut by the pancreas. So the pancreas helps to balance that. So that's an interesting kind of little connection there. Um, the proton pumps are technically hydrogen potassium ATPase pumps. They're found on the luminal surface and they pump the hydrogen ions in the stomach lumen. And they are the targets of those acid blocking medications, proton pump inhibitors. Um, and so I talked about, for example, Prilosec uh, is one uh, example of that. So um, that is one example of a PPI. Um, so that's the proton pumps. Um, again, there's three signals that are needed for the parietal cell to release its acid. So the vagus nerve with acetylcholine um, that binds to the M receptors. Now, I mentioned there are things that can block the parasympathetics, and one of them is atropine. So atropine can block the M receptors, and that will decrease stomach acid. And atropine is often used for too much secretion. It's not, it has a lot of side effects because it's affecting blocking parasympathetics everywhere. Um, but it uh, used to be used more for stomach acid and overactive stomach and things like that. Now it's used primarily in very limited instances for people with very uh, special types of IBS where they're getting too much parasympathetic stimulation. Um, gastrin is gonna also be needed to secrete acid and um, histamine, and that's gonna be released by those enterochromaffin cells. So all of these, and again, the H2 blockers uh, like the tagamate, somatidine will also decrease stomach acid. So those are the three signals keep in mind for acid secretion and then somatostatin inhibits. Now, one thing I will also say, which is not depicted here in the diagram, is these same cells, the parietal cells, release uh, intrinsic factor. So parietal cells, remember, they release both acid and intrinsic factor. The pepsinogen secreting cells, they are chief cells. They're different than the parietal cells and they secrete pepsinogen in a zymogen form that's inactive, and then in the stomach acid, it becomes active, activated to pepsin. And uh, that's secreted in that zymogen form to protect the stomach lining, to keep it from being damaged. Um, and the pepsin helps the process of protein breakdown into peptides. And again, that's gonna account for about 20% of total protein digestion. The rest of it's gonna happen in the small intestine under the action of uh, pancreatic proteases. So the pancreas will secrete a large amount of enzymes to break the proteins down further. So let's dive one more time, a little more deeply into the mechanical digestion. We just looked at chemical digestion, but mechanical digestion in the stomach. Um, when the food enters the stomach, it's got to fill and stretch. And it's got to stretch again, sometimes up to four liters. Typically with a meal, it stretches to about a liter and a half. But importantly, it's got to stretch and not increase the pressure. Otherwise, if it increased pressure in the stomach, all the food would just shoot back up the esophagus. Uh, and that happens through very special mechanisms that dilate the walls uh, via the enteric nervous system. Uh, some of the things involved here are nitric oxide, NO, very important gas for vasodilation in blood vessels, um, but also important for relaxing the stomach wall and serotonin. Uh, then there are the peristaltic motion. They pass to the stomach every 15 to 25 seconds or so, uh, you know, three or so times per minute. Uh, and they macerate the food, mix it with the gastric juices, and they're going to form the chyme. Uh, and I mentioned the pacemaker cells, those interstitial cells of Cajal, that actually uh, they're found in the longitudinal muscle, and they determine the rate of peristalsis. And they create those three that basic electrical rhythm, which is the three peristaltic waves per minute in the stomach. Now we'll see that in the small intestine, like the duodenum, the ileum jejunum, small large intestine, there are also pacemakers, but they have different rhythms. So the peristaltic waves in the stomach are not the same as the rhythms in the other parts of the intestines as we go through. Um, the rate of firing is determined by that basic electrical rhythm. Um, but the force of the contraction is going to be uh, determined by the vagal innervation and other hormones like the uh, secretin and cholecystokinin and so forth uh, on the smooth muscle. 
and this will determine gastric motility. So basically parasympathetics will increase gastric motility, passive food, more, food will pass more quickly, sympathetics will decrease it. Um, and then as each mixing wave is gonna propel that chyme to the pylorus, a little bit, about three milliliters, is forced through the normally closed pyloric sphincter. It opens just a little bit. So basically every time these mixing waves come down from the cardia towards the pylorus in the stomach, you're gonna force a little bit of chyme out into the duodenum. And that way the duodenum doesn't get overloaded with this bolus of chyme coming through. And it takes about, like I said, it can take a couple of hours. Uh, so if we look at the time that it takes, it's on average between two and four hours after eating a meal before the stomach is empty again. Um, so four hours, most foods are gonna be through it. Liquid's gonna stay very quickly. The solids will stay longer. Um, carbohydrates take the least amount of time to pass through. Fats the most, in fact, very high fat meals. It can take up to six hours to empty the stomach. So that's why a lot of people, when there's fat in the food, they feel more satiety. As the stomach is stretched less, it secretes, it secretes less of that hormone ghrelin. Remember ghrelin? Ghrelin talks to the brain, and when ghrelin levels are high, it's gonna tell you to eat. So if the stomach remains distended, there's food in there, and it hasn't cleared out, the ghrelin secretion decreases, and so people won't have that signal to eat. So that's why eating fat in the food can sometimes uh, make you ultimately eat less calories and uh, eat less often and so forth. Um, the rate of gastric emptying is gonna be, again, to depend on the food, so too fast. Uh, that's gonna have a problem of having reduced digestion of the foods. So that's why carbohydrate foods pass through very quickly, but it's not really enough time, especially if there's some protein there, to uh, fully kind of start that protein digestion process. Too slow, you can start having the highly acid chyme now damaging the stomach lining. Um, the pyloric sphincter, again, is the sphincter between the lower stomach and the duodenum. Uh, in some cases, you can get a situation where it becomes hypertrophy, and that's called pyloric stenosis. And that can prevent the passage of chyme, and that results in projectile vomiting. Um, there's a very distinct olive-shaped mass that you can palpate in that region of the stomach on abdominal exam. So that's something to think about for especially um, uh, people that have had either like long-standing acid problems um, or sometimes can happen in uh, babies as well. But basically, pyloric stenosis prevents the food from emptying from the stomach into the duodenum. Dumping syndrome is if you remove a portion of the stomach, which happens, for example, there are some bariatric surgery now where they basically staple um, part of the stomach. That's called a gastric bypass or sleeve, sleeve I'm sorry, it's called the sleeve gastrectomy. The bypass is where you actually take part of the stomach and attach it lower down past the duodenum. That's the bypass. But the sleeve gastrectomy is where you basically make the stomach about a third of, the, of its normal size to prevent people from eating excess calories. But unfortunately, you get a large amount of hypertonic fluid that passes into the duodenum. And uh, that can actually pull water from cells in circulation. And that can create what's called dumping syndrome where you uh, basically, it drains water out of the body. And um, so this can create a dangerous collapse in your circulatory volume that can lead to shock, hypovolemic shock in some cases. Um, so here people need to eat small meals and regular meals instead of big meals to prevent that from happening. Um, okay, so again, I mentioned absorption of the stomach. Not a whole lot happens there except for a little bit of alcohol, caffeine, water, and some lipid soluble drugs like aspirin, things like that can be absorbed through the stomach. Last, I'll just mention some biomedical correlates here with the stomach. So stomach yang, uh, again, is the metabolism of the stomach, the arterial blood flow, oxygenation, so forth. Stomach yang deficiency would be less metabolism, less acid, pepsin, decreased capacity for catabolism of food, really lack of stomach fire, as we'd say, and we see that often associated with what we might call spleen and kidney uh, qi deficiency as well. Um, and then with stomach yang excess, that would be more of a heat pattern with excess acid, excess catabolism, and that would be things like gastritis, peptic ulcer, and so forth. We often find liver heat, we call liver invading spleen patterns involved with that. Um, this is important because stomach yang problems often result in um, reflux, 
acid reflux and heartburn. Again, we'll look at that in the pathology section. But, you know, a lot of people with acid reflux actually have low acid in the stomach. And what happens is the food sits in the stomach too long, creates too much pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter. And then we have reflux going up into the esophagus. And so the treatment really would be to actually increase stomach acid into increased peristalsis. So that would be more of a young deficiency versus there are people, I'd guesstimate 20%, uh, I've seen clinically, that do not respond well at all to those acid-stimulating herbal therapies and whatnot, vinegar. They actually truly do have too high acid. And that often has to do with uh, bile reflux and things like that. A lot of people that actually get acid reflux get reflux of bile. It goes all the way up from the duodenum through the stomach. And uh, so that's a different pattern altogether. Uh, stomach chi would be the autonomic nerve activity. So again, parasympathetic increases peristalsis, sympathetics decrease peristalsis as well as secretions. So stomach chi deficiency, decrease acid, pepsin, decrease peristalsis, more bloating. And then excess would be more cramping constriction, lower esophageal sphincter tone, decrease, we get reflux, things like that. Um, stomach blood would be the gut hormones. So we might see with stomach blood deficiency, atrophy of the wall, decreased secretions like in chronic gastritis. And then excess blood could be the hemorrhage bleeding we might see in the bleeding states. And then potentially blood stagnation uh, could lead to poor oxygenation and so forth to the wall. And then yin would be the mucus microbiome, which is pretty limited to H. pylori. Uh, stomach yin deficiency would be decreased mucus, increased ulcers. And then the yin excess would be lots of phlegm. So we can talk about not so much SIBO or dysbiosis, that happens in large intestine and small intestine, but stomach SIBO. Um, basically, that would be overgrowth of H. pylori, um, increased mucus, and so forth. So this would be uh, some potential stomach patterns and then herbal treatments that you have learned to, to correlate with each of them. So that's an overview for the upper GI physiology. In the next video, we'll jump into small intestine and large intestine.